So, hello everybody. I welcome Andreas Mund, who wants to explain something about new developments in Debian Edo. Just enjoy this total talk. Okay, welcome to the buff about Debian Edu. Um, I will explain the current status and then I want to discuss, discuss how to continue with the work and how we can uh, build on what we have today and uh, develop the system even more. Okay. It's my very first talk at the DEPCONF, so I just want to introduce myself. I uh, have a scientific background. I studied physics, and I spent several years at university doing quantum optics research. Then I um, worked in an optics company for about three years, but I quit that job, and now I'm teaching at school. And uh, my students are in the age from 10 up to 19, 20 years old. And uh, in this process, switching to the work at school, I started to work with Debian Edu. And uh, I'm looking forward to run a Debian system at school someday. OK, just a small outline of the talk. I want to briefly show you the history of Debian Edu. <coughs> Then I will explain the system architecture and show you how the Debian Edu installation works. I will quickly go through the new features we have now implemented in our squeeze release. And then I want to, the, want to come to the main topic <coughs> where I also ask you to bring in ideas and comments. What are our goals for VC and the future? I will uh, discuss a few problems of Debian Edu from my point of view, question the Debian Edu Skole Linux philosoph philosophy, and I have some ideas and thoughts. <coughs> I sketch a system uh, which might solve some of these issues, and then in the end I want to invite you to help with your input and your knowledge and your ideas. Okay, let's start with the very first point. We have to celebrate this year because Devin Edu or Skole Linux has become 10 years old now. And uh, today we have a lot of local groups in France, in Germany, Norway, <coughs> probably much more, which use this system which modify it and which contribute to Debian Edu Skole Linux. <coughs> okay, what is the system? What does the system look like? I brought a picture here <coughs> and you see a, a setup I want to quickly explain. We have a main server and this main server uh, contains all uh, services we need for the system. So there's an LDAP database, Kerberos, KDC, home directory, web server, also Nagios and some other um, tools are installed on this server. And uh, apart from this server, we have other profiles, like you see here terminal server and workstations. Uh, workstations. These are Debian machines with a lot of uh, educational packages <coughs> and the terminal servers, they can serve these subnets here, you can see in the, at the bottom, and you can use disk class clients there or um, thin clients. And they boot with P PXE and so you have to uh, only do the administration on the LTSP server, and you can have 20 machines of these thin clients or disk class clients without additional um, system administration. Then we have roaming workstations, which are thought to be for um, machines that are not permanently in the network, like laptops. 
Okay, how does how is it possible to install such a system? It's pretty simple with Debian Edu. We have a, a customized Debian installer with our own artwork. So you just start the DVD. Uh, you choose your language, you choose your country, a key map, and then you have all these profiles I showed before to choose from. You can also combine these profiles so you can have a main server also combined with a workstation or with a LTSP terminal server, <coughs> so that's no problem. Then you are asked if you are uh, happy with the automatic partitioning. You say yes, you enter the root password and all uh, will be done for you. So the, the, the whole system will be set up depending on the profile you, you've, you've chosen before and there's not much more to do than to just connect the machines as you, as you planned it. Okay, what's new with the Debian Edu Squeeze release? <coughs> uh, we've now Kerberos for authentication and single sign-on. So quite some services are moved to Kerberos authentication. We don't need, uh, have, we don't have the problem that we have <coughs> um, passwords traveling through the network and things like that. It's all done with Kerberos now. So this is uh, one, feature, one new feature. Then we have a new graphical administration front, front end. <coughs> this is very important for schools because usually the system administration is not done by professional administrators, but uh, teachers which get uh, uh, some time off their usual job. And it's important for them that they uh, that this part is as easy as possible. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with GOSA, it's used by the city of Munich for their um, administration, and we've now included it in um, now a squeeze release, and well we, well, we have to see if it fits our needs and if it works like we uh, expected it, and then see uh, how to continue on, on that topic. Okay, then, <clears throat> as I said, roaming profile for laptops is also a new innovation with the squeeze release, and we've also switched to NFS version 4, which is important for the Kerberos stuff. This is not uh, finished yet, this transition, but it's all there to continue on, the, on that point. Okay, now <clears throat> uh, from the past over the present to the future, what are the goals for VC? <clears throat> I will just have a look at problems I see for current Debian Edu. Uh, related is questioning the Debian Edu school Linux philosophy, thoughts and ideas to solve the these, some of these issues, and a sketch of the uh, system I propose or I. I could imagine that it would uh, have some advantages. Of course, some other disadvantages <coughs> uh, will also be there. Okay, um, what is our problem in Debian Edu? We have a lot of supporters, local user groups, teachers at schools, which work on, on fine-tuning for their local area but we have much too few contrib contributors for the Debian Edu config package. The C Debian Edu config package is, um, it's a, uh, well, let's say an ugly package which at the end of the installation does a lot of tweaks to the system which are, well, it's, there's going on a, a little dispute if they are policy compliant or not. Most of them are probably not compliant. And this Debian Edu config package is mainly uh, worked on by sometimes zero people, sometimes one, of, of three, one or two, and three is really the, the largest number I've ever been seen working on that package on a, on a regular basis, you know? And I ask myself, why is this the case? 
And well, perhaps the package is simply too involved and too complex. I made the experience if you can't follow the evolution of, of, of the system continuously, you're quickly lost. And then with every modification you do, you break the system at some point and you t it takes another uh, couple of hours, if not days, to fix it again. <clears throat> so then uh, we have our own installer, which is great, of course, but on the other hand, uh, to test this, this package, we've always to do an, an, a new installation. And this installation takes about half a day, because there are about 25 gigabytes software installed for the main server and workstation and terminal server. And yeah, you, you fix the package, you have to upload the package, you have to wait until new CD is built, and then <coughs> you run the installation in, on a virtual machine. And in most cases, you found that you've overseen a little thing in your uh, code, and you start again, and then the day is over. So this has a high frustration potential. I hope you can understand this. So over the years, a lot of people that contributed moved more and more into a, a passive uh, position where they just look what others do. I got the impression. And I, at, I now can really understand them because it's really, yeah, you, you get at some point, you have the impression, I don't learn anything anymore. It's just fixing, fixing, and you run in a circle, and with everything you fix, you break something else, and so you're kind of trapped. And you're, only if you have really, really a lot of time, you're able to um, develop something new. Okay, I've already um, summarized that. <coughs> There are almost no resources left for new developments, only keeping the status as possible. And, well, I kind of understand this as, a, um, as being due to the fact that we modify the configuration of, of a lot of packages. It's simply necessary because this, this, the system is really um, working out of the box. So we have to fo focus on a lot of small details and we use CF Engine and things like that to bring this all in, in the shape we want to have it. And of course, if something changes, then uh, you have to react on these changes, but if you are only a few people working on it, then it takes quite a lot of time. And <coughs> uh, there is a famous bug which addresses this modification of configuration files, and it's like this bug. It, it was, when it was um, added to the bug tracking system, it was thought that at some time we will solve this bug. And it's just um, there for some time as a reminder, but we're working on solving this bug. But at the moment, I have to say, we have no time to, to work in direction of solving this bug. That's a question. Oh. Yep. Um, <coughs> from, I wonder if this half a day is when I do an installation of the main server and you have it, the packages in a proxy, the installation takes an hour. So I'm a bit surprised. Even with those 25 gigabytes, I wonder if your test system is so slow and if a faster test system which we could host on the net and use with KVM and people can access remotely would help for development? Maybe my machine is for sure not the fastest one. So it's about probably five years old or something like that. But even if, if the installation is, is faster, there's a lot of things you have to do by hand, like uploading the package and things like that. So. Uh, tedious work that, yeah, that, that's kind of annoying. Well, the, the, what Debian Edo is, is mostly some modifications to Debian, so we can only test the result by or testing the installation, because that is 
what we do. So I think it's somehow inherent, but maybe we should really look to get a faster machine which is available for Debian and Edu developers so they can test on a faster machine to get this time halved, which is then still bad, but less frustrating. Okay. And, and the other thing, um, I think one, one problem we have is that uh, we always, we have still not released our squeeze. So squeeze is still in the final steps of being released. So we are always behind development. And in the past we've been often there that um, Debian was already frozen and we could not really do changes anymore. So I think this is also blocking us very much. So I think we should really get there that we release the squeeze very soon and then have now still a year till VZ is frozen or 11 months. Two questions. One is why wait for the CD or DVD generation? Can they be done on a local machine? Maybe self-generation and testing instead of uploading and uh, re-downloading. Maybe if you inject uh, the new package to an existing CD will be easier. And the second one, maybe some kind of mechanisms that also does installation with uh, an answer uh, answers file on a VM machine. So it goes, every time the CD is generated, it tries an installation and saves the result, I don't know, for a day two, or at least the log. So you actually won't have to do something manually, but just to connect to an installed machine and test the result. Uh, um, I was actually doing what Lior has suggested when I was testing our uh, installation packages, which by now are the only packages we still have. Uh, I used to build the package locally and inject it into the into the CD image that I had on disk. So all I had to do was to to burn again the CD image, and that would shorten the the cycle. Okay. Okay. Um, for sure, you can improve that, but keep in mind, um, you also have to uh, work on this, this uh, testing infrastructure. And this, I have the impression, also takes a lot of time, because we, we have our CD, our, our DVD, builder and <clears throat> all these things, they have to be maintained as well. And well, it's also that sometimes things don't work and you, it, it takes some time until someone looks at it and then I, it's working fine again. But um, yeah, I thought about how, how can this, this we, we reduce this double infrastructure, okay? Can I comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I got an account on cdimage.debian.org to build the Debian Edu CDs there. I just have not got around to do it. So that is um, absolutely planned to, to build the CDs on the regular Debian host, and then we can get rid of that part of the infrastructure. And for getting rid of the archive, we need to... Uh, we used to have like 20 or some in the past 50 modified packages in Debian Edu. And nowadays, it's only the packages starting Debian Edu asterisk. So w once we have them, in if, uh, once we can use them from Debian, we don't have to use our own repository anymore. anymore. So that will speed up things, but it's because we're always lacking, I think. It's why we need to operate our own infrastructure. In the past, like five years ago, it was really useful to have that. But nowadays, it's getting more and more blocker because there are less people working on Debian Edu and those need to um, maintain this infrastructure instead of developing that we need to. No. Okay. Um, well, I, I want to ask a few basic or more, say, radical questions about how we, how we address or what, what, our, what the goal of our system is. Up to now, it has been, uh, the, it has been the goal that you install the system and it works out of the box. And of course, this is a really challenging um, uh, goal. 
because you're installing a system for a whole school, and the only thing the guy that, that uh, installs the system has to know is his password, more or less. He has to have an idea about uh, the, the, uh, the, the system infrastructure, what machine he wants to install at the moment, and then he, as I showed in the beginning, he just enters, chooses his language and a few other things, and the system is set up. And uh, it was very strictly uh, demanded that this stays the same. For example, it, it, it makes a lot of work to use the, the password you enter also for your uh, KDC and for some other tools you've, you're using because you have to, you, usually you don't have the clear text password. So you have to tweak in the installer to keep that, that, that um, clear text password and use it also for other services, which also might be a security. Um, uh, issue. And, well, it was said, we don't want to have two passwords or something more complicated because our goal is to have this as simple as possible. And I ask myself, um, if we really need such a system, which is so simple, will a guy that depends on the simplicity of the installation, will he be happy with the system in the end? And I think the, the answer is no, because shortly after the installation there will, be, there will pop up things that are not perfectly solved and if he just uh, is able to uh, click on a few installation things and not more, then he will be lost anyway. So I uh, <clears throat> want to ask if this is really a, a valid goal at the moment. <clears throat> okay. Another argument in that direction is a lot of local groups I mentioned earlier use Debian Edu, but they, I know of no group which really uses it as out of the box. There are, for sure are groups or schools, but the, the main or the most um, known groups, at least I know in Europe, uh, they heavily tune the system for their needs. They take it as an inspiration, they use what they think is a good idea, but they sometimes massively modify it. And <clears throat> so, uh, another argument for not taking two, uh, taking this this goal that any, everything works out of the box and is as simple as possible um, may be relaxed at some point. Okay, then, <clears throat> of course, you have different types of school, schools, with small children, with uh, almost grown-up students, and the packages you provide depend heavily on the, on the school you're installing the system. Currently, the focus is a bit on, uh, yeah, I would say up to 14, 15 children, primary school, something like that. And it's a bit of a waste that we don't um, open this up a bit and make it also more flexible related to the package selection. So that you can, for example, choose for primary school or for secondary school or some uh, uh, school where perhaps even uh, grown-ups are, are, are taught. <clears throat> so this is also a point I, I want to stress. Um, okay, then <clears throat> how, can we, how can we find more people interested in, in the system? How can we find more developers and more users? And if you look at the system, you see the system, the networking part, it's completely general and it's no, in no way special to a school. So you could also use that uh, for a small enterprise or for some association which runs a little office or 
a university work group, they could use this system as well as every school. And I uh, would like to develop the system in a more flexible and more modularized way so that these uh, groups also uh, can, can use it. <clears throat> Why? Of course, you can use a lot of syner synergies between this uh, broader user and developer base. <clears throat> and if you modularize, modularize it more, it's, it's easier to um, focus on one part of the system. So if someone is a spe specialist for networking, he doesn't have to look which packages are installed for the primary school. So his job is to make the system work, the, net, the, the networking. So <clears throat> by choosing more, a more, more modularized system, I hope that part-time developers are able to work on the system and will not, after being away for two or three months, com be completely lost and not, not understand anymore what, what, what happened. And <clears throat> uh, of course, it also hel helps with testing and testing the single comp components. Uh, for these different profiles, this is a, a goal I, I want to look in myself. Is perhaps it's possible to to use uh, five fully automatic installation and. I, I can imagine that you provide different um, classes, different five classes. For example, for a school, for a primary school, you have a class. For a, a small enterprise, you have a class. And our users can also modify these classes. And it's easy to uh, include them then in the next release. So that it's simple for the, for the uh, say, downstream to provide uh, their ideas for inclusion in our system. But this is just an idea. I haven't uh, worked on it up to now. But I want to start on that. I think, I think Ronnie Arsen is doing that. He uses Fi to install Debian Edu. Sorry? So Ronnie, Ronnie Zepp on IRC is doing that, I think. OK. So you can ask him for that classes. <laughs> Okay, now I've sketched a proposed system which is uh, a very radical uh, change. You could start with a standard Debian installation, then you run a script which does all the stuff currently done by Debian Edu, Debian Edu config. This is at the moment included in the installation. So you may scream, ah, oh, that's not allowed, but Nothing else happens when, when the Debian Edu installation uh, is run. So then you have your main server with all the stuff you need. And in addition, you have these, the file packages and corresponding classes, as I explained it just now. And then you install the other machines over the network. <coughs> you, could, you, you wouldn't need any installer, CD, DVD, nothing. No need to work on that. The modifications are much more transparent to users and developers because you have this set of scripts which does all modifications. Everybody can easily send a patch for that. It's, it's clear how it works. Um, there's no uh, installer tweaking, which is rather complicated, which is difficult to test. <coughs> And, of course, on the downside, it does not work out of the box. Mm, the, for the first point, that you don't need customized CDs or DVDs, how would you get your, your updated packages? Because you don't want to rely on Debian's latest stable distribution. You want your own packages inside. So at no, least, no, no. So at least in, the, in your customized CD, you can inject your own packages, or at least the... A school in a config, but here, how would you do it? Yeah, Holger, you want to answer? 
We don't want our own customized packages. We want them in Debian. We have them in Debian. Just now. N not customized packages. Even the installer or the config, which is, although it might be only one package, you still want the latest version. Yeah, that, that's the script. That's the script mentioned here. You run a script. So this will be done by the script now. Can I maybe add to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm not the most active in school Linux, but I, try, uh, I believe I can clarify that little issue there. What is currently done by school Linux, correct me if I'm wrong, is not extra packages that need to be part of, of the DVD, but it is the, uh, the triggering mechanism of deep depth preceding needs to be done very early with the current thing that he's proposing to do afterwards instead of integrate it directly with the Debian installer. Yeah, yeah. So just to be clear on the answer, so you, you want people to install Debian and then download the separate script and run it? But if there's a change to the script and it's already in Debian, you won't have the updated version. Or may I, maybe I'm missing something. Yes. It is tricky. It is if you have time enough to read bug 31, 11, 88, the, 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 let me try to summarize it. That it it's, it's, everything is in Debian. Scholar Linux exists in Debian. Scholar Linux uses, makes use of this, this uh, configuration package in a different way than can, is possible to do with standard Debian CD. They need to set a flag in the CD media so that it uses Debian in a different way than Debian is possible to use Debian. Okay? Are you following me? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everything is in Debian. The scripts that, that uh, Andreas wants to invoke after the installation is currently in School Linux invoked by the Debian installer. And if you invoke it by the Debian installer, then it violates Debian policy. If you don't invoke it by the installer, then it's not packages doing it. It's okay. I'm wrong here. I'm stopping now. Fine. My name is Peter Reynoldsen. I'm the person behind the philosophy of School Linux and uh, initial design and the architecture and all that stuff. Anyway, uh, Jonas has uh, some good points, but uh, there is a disagreement between me and him on what's actually policy compliant. I read the policy to mean that when you install a packet, it will not do some things, uh, while he reads it that if you install a packet and do some configuration, it will still not do some things. Uh, basically, in School Linux, we set some flags and do some preceding to make sure we tell our packages to behave a certain way and configure some things. I believe that to be po policy compliant, and Jonas do not, but uh, that's a question of interpretation. Uh, the thing we agree on is that it's a bad idea to do it the way we do, because it breaks upgrades. So we should get rid of that anyway. But uh, that's why I was shaking my head for uh, Jonas's comment on breaking the policy. Uh, when that is said, uh, there's so much things I could say about uh, the proposals from, uh, from Andreas, and uh, we probably should discuss it. but. Uh, I'd rather you completed your talk first, and then we'll go yeah, on to it's not the long discussions. Maybe I just continue. It's, it will be finished in about three minutes, I guess, and then start with the discussion. OK, I already said that all other machines are then installed over the network. And in the first goal, we, uh, in the first, uh, f for these machines, we should try to get rid of these this modification of config files. So uh, all customization should be done by um, preceding. So th then we have a first step where we can work on, if w w where we have a chance to win because these, these machines in the network are not so complicated. So that's really something we, sh we should be able to do. <coughs> and wh what, what are the advantages? <coughs> You have a clear split between main server and other machines. Uh, you have, with these classes, you can simply do uh, easy prototyping of new, uh, new sort of machines. 
things like that, and that can also do every every user. And if he has a nicely working machine, he can send us his his class, and we can include it. And uh, well, okay. And also, upgrade reinstallation of machines other than the main server should work without problems after that. Okay, so now we already started with some discussion. I uh, already set up um, the Gobi thing. Maybe I can just uh, start it here. And you're welcome to... Uh, did I lose the connection, right? Huh? Maybe we can uh, feel free to discuss the topics I've written, what I set down here, and now... Large enough? Fine or okay. So to um, give some comments on the uh, design of School Linux, uh, a lot of the things you have uh, described has been always part of the original design of uh, the School Linux systems, and uh, uh, your. Uh, indication there is a conflict between ease of installation and uh, flexibility. I don't think that's a true conflict. I believe it's perfectly possible to both have a simple installation that works out of the box and a flexible system that can be tuned whichever way you want. And it's always been a goal in School Linux to make that possible, even if the features have been hidden most of the time, because uh, it's always been a goal for us to be able to convince uh, unsure or hostile users to actually try school Linux and for that to happen you need to have a very easy to install system where you can actually get up and running and get a feeling of the advantages before they make the commitment to actually uh, move to Linux and of course uh, convincing people to move to Linux has always been the goal of school Linux not convincing Linux users to move over to school Linux because the Windows users and the Macintosh users are the, the goal of the project the others are already on our side. We don't really need to convince Red Hat users to use Linux. Uh, there are so few of them, <laughs> that's not worth the effort. Uh, so uh, I think you should definitely move ahead and, and continue making the system more flexible and making it more easy to, to customize. Uh, some of the uh, initial designs were, of course, based on limitations in Debian installer and the framework we had available, and also the limited resources we have. Uh, we've gotten us a long way, as Holger said. We started with a lot of customized packages and have been, a have been able over the years to convince a lot of maintainers to modify their installation system to allow pre-seeding to configure all the things, or at least all the important things uh, we needed. We've dropped a few features as well because we decided it wasn't important enough to keep differences from Debian. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I, I really think it's important to keep the installation system out of the box to be actually working. Uh, but it's perfectly possible to have one more question like, do you want the advanced features? And then you get heaps of more questions and heaps of more options. But if I want my relig relig religion teacher from high school to actually install anything, he, he will not be able to understand half of the question that's all there already. And we don't really want to increase the cognitive strain of uh, the person trying out school Linux for the first time without a really good reason. So, I'd li like to remind that there's, besides preceding, the other policy compliant 
way to modify packages to drop configuration files into the directory, like Apache conf D or these things. So we can, we can also use that. It doesn't have to be preceding. And what I don't understand in your proposal is you're proposing to um, replace Debian edu config by a script to make things easier. But Debian edu config is basically a script. Yes, but it's, it's, it's much more complex. Because so if you tell someone yeah, you, he wants to change this and that, then he has to set up his, the whole CD building stuff and has to build a, his, his own Debian edu config package. But if you have just the script, it's easy to hack the script for his special needs. But you can just run post ins and that's, huh? you can run post ins and that's the script. I what he means that the actual script is the post install script, you which you can just edit and rerun whenever you want. So there might be a package that actually packages the script, but it's generally the same thing. Yeah, but it's it's combined with with some other features in in, in with some other stuff in Debian Edu config. Okay, um, returning to some of your previous points, you mentioned that you want to have a very simple installation that, that not many people would want to do and after config, a configuration after the installation. On the other hand, you mentioned that the complexity is a blocker and the third point was that people actually do modify their systems. So I think we should better, th we should better rethink about which is the target audience because if people do modify the installation afterwards, we might convert some of the complexity of the scripts to good documentation and just let them do it by hand afterwards. We still need some basic version that will work out of the box, but on top of that, we can just let them do additions and changes manually. Of course, it would have to be wrapped in some way so they won't just edit files or hack the packages, but something that still can be done relatively easily. To give a quick summary of what School Linux Debian EDU actually is, it's a set of precedings for the installer. It's a set of precedings for the packages, packages being installed. It's a partitioning uh, set of partitioning rules, and there is a bunch of packages being installed, like packages, package selection. selection. And last, there is some rewriting on configuration file at the end to make sure that the packages that didn't support preceding will get a proper configuration in the end. That are all the parts that's uh, school Linux. And uh, of course, the configurations, the set of configuration uh, changes, preceding or otherwise, that's like the, the concept in, in action. But for the installer, it's basically just setting up the preceding of the uh, of the partitioner based on the profile you ask for and then it selects the packages you uh, want based on the profile you ask for and then it continues and install them and then eventually end up uh, rewriting i don't remember if we actually rewrite more than one or two files i think the squid config maybe and some one more so there's very little left being rewritten at the end of the installation because almost all the packages have been Preceedable for like five years now, um, and uh, the complexity we can get rid of is—it's uh, not really much left there. The uh, script that's been running by from Debian edu config is the thing that's rewriting uh, thing at the end, and there is almost nothing left there. Uh, of course, installing the packages we want—that's a meta packet, or actually it's a task cell task, but it's also a meta packet. And partitioning, well, we do have some expectations on the partitioning. You need this size for USR. We, need, we want to have LVM. Uh, and the installer can be preceded any way you want if you want to change the password of the root system. Or, well, we can do all sorts of things. For example, I've done some installation where we uh, change the partitioning. But we also have some interesting complexities in the installer. We run a background job to uh, check if the file systems are full and extend them if they are. Uh, to be able to install extra, extra packages, you can actually precede 
outside the Debian system. We have done this with PXE installation of uh, Debian EDU. You can pre-seed extra packages, and uh, when you uh, you do that, you actually uh, can install ex more packages. And if you install like Open JDK, that was a problem earlier, uh, you will fill up USR because it's a huge packet. And to handle that, we actually made a background package that process that will resize partitions on the fly during installation. But that's just sugar on the top. It's not part of the installation that's a vital part. You just have to make sure the partitions are big enough. So I hand over the mic for the last question or last remark. Um, so the background process during the installer that resizes uh, the volumes sounds like something that would be really useful for a Debian installer in general. Um, if you could contribute that back to Debian installer, that would be great. Um, and then my other question was just that if there are only a couple of packages whose config files are being mangled by this post script, uh, if you filed bugs against those packages asking for debconf parameters to do what you need them to do, uh, because if you haven't, it would be great to have those bugs so we have the documentation. Okay, thanks. So, so thank, thanks for this fruitful discussion. I, I'm, I'm really sure we, we can continue it and it will be continued. I'm trusting you. And I, for several years. And I really hope that Debian Edu will be a success. I, I'm really proud on this project. The next, uh, pro uh, the next talk will be also here in this room, the Debian Science Roundtable. So feel free to join. And thank you, Andreas. Yeah, thank you all.